ask you the question, do you like music? I'm pretty sure that 100% of you will say, yes, I love it. What about learning music? For those in the room who had the chance to, to learn music, I'm pretty sure you have like bad memories of uh, music lessons. Uh, so this is what I would like to, to talk to you about. I see music as a, as a big party. As you can see, these are my friends I play music with in Europe, in Asia. Uh, there is a, a fanfare we created in Hong Kong. You see, it's very happy. Uh, and uh, I, I see it as a celebration of something, yeah, great, that uh, playing music is a great way of expressing yourself. Uh, it's a great way of never being bored also because you always have something to learn. It's a great way to meet people and to bring people together. But the party is, uh, is a bit ruined because we have to learn music. We have to go through music theory, understanding how music notation uh, works, uh, practicing through repetition. And all this is tedious, boring, and uh, sometimes painful. So I'm not here to give a lesson because music is my passion. I'm not a professional. But I would like to share with you um, a different way of looking at music that can help uh, taking shortcuts and accelerating music uh, learning for some, uh, some, uh, some kids. Uh, I had the chance to meet someone who inspired me deeply. He was called uh, Jeannot Vedrine, and he used to uh, give me piano lessons in, uh, in this uh, little shop in my hometown. And uh, he was very talented, very humble, and he was teaching me music without talking about music notes. He would talk about textures, he would talk about emotions, and he would show me how to make them happen. And that was great. And this, uh, why do I share this with you? Because it leads to the, to the observation that we have a, a lot of great musicians who uh, can play music, but they're not incapable of reading a single note of a music score. So how, how do they do that? It means that there are probably other ways of understanding music other ways of seeing music. I kept on, uh, so our path went uh, different ways. Uh, Jeannot unfortunately passed away and I, I kept on learning music by myself, but always with asking to myself what kind of, what form of learning would work better for me. And this is when I started uh, drawing shapes uh, and I realized that he was helping me. It was helping me making progress, understanding things that I couldn't understand before in music. And I kind of developed that kind of self-made method, personal method that was helping me uh, get further in music. So I'm gonna try to make it, uh, to keep it simple, but there is one big concept in music that I want you to, that is difficult to understand in music, is the fact that music is linear and periodic. What does linear mean? You have, imagine like uh, you're standing in front of a piano and you have all these keys that range from the low keys to the high keys. Those keys, we can uh, spread them on the line, right? We're gonna say that uh, melodically, music will be linear from the low to the high. But harmonically, we have different notes that have the same harmonic value. I'm gonna give you an example. So, that's what I call linear, melodically. But we have notes that have the same harmonic value because of the harmonics. And this is what we're gonna say, it's uh, harmonically, music is periodic. And the simplest form to represent a periodic environment is a circle. And my way of seeing music is based on that circle, what we call the chromatic circle. So it's very, uh, very simple. You draw a circle and you put the 12 notes on the circle. In the system we use, we have 12 notes. 12 is a good number because we can divide it by two, we can divide it by three, 
we can divide it by four, we can divide it by six, we can divide it by 12, of course. But we start seeing shapes appearing. We see like intervals between notes appearing. And imagine that we play different notes together and those notes, we link them together. Then we're gonna create shapes. So this is, this is how I see music. When I play, this is how I see it. So this is how music started taking shape uh, for me. And I was happy to see that it was making sense. Uh, so how those shapes apply to music? Imagine that uh, they apply at three levels. Structure, harmony, and melody. So this is how you can see the brain of a, of a musician, a big round cake with three layers. You have the structure of the song, you have the harmony and the melody. The structure is the arrangement of a song. The harmony is um, notes played simultaneously that will create a texture through vibration. So we can, i show you an example, we can play a texture that is happy, a texture that is sad, a texture that is light, something sad maybe, or melancholic. This is what we call harmony. And the melody, easy to understand, it's a sequence of notes that are played uh, one after another and that are perceived as an entity by the listener. So all the shapes that I've sh uh, shown you, they can apply at those three different levels. And the funny thing is that for me, it helped me understand uh, some of the musicians that I really like. So you see Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock, and Joel Coltrane. I will give you just a few examples. So this is so what one of the one of the most famous songs. It's called uh, So What, and it's a, it's based on a on a chord. I will give you an example. It's based on that this chord. And this chord is kind of difficult to visualize on a keyboard, but when you play it through a geometric representation, as uh, you've seen, it's a pentagram. Another example, it's an harmony that Herbie Hancock uses all the time. It's this one. When you play it geometrically, it creates a shape that has a symmetry. Another example, the structure of the blue. So it's maybe simpler. Maybe you have, we have musicians in the room who play the blues. Uh, that's the structure of the, uh, of the song of the, any blues, yeah. Giant Step, another very famous song by John Coltrane. The whole song is based on a division of the scale by three. And uh, it's, a, it's a song that is very difficult to memorize if we don't understand the structure. And uh, this is how it looks on the music score, right? So when you see that, you need to know how those notations work, right? But believe me or not, this is all the shapes that he's using. Remember the cake with three layers? Then this is, this is a song that is entirely geometric. On the structure level, on the harmonic level, and the melodic level. <coughs> The thing that is very interesting about this song is the name. It's called Giant Steps. The whole song is structured on a division of the scale by three. It creates three in so you, 12, 12 notes, we divide it by three, right? And this in so it creates three intervals that we call a major third. And what it does, it, de it develops melodies and chord progressions, sec little sections, and it, transpose them by this division of three. And the funny thing is, in music, you take a melody, you transpose it by this interval, so it's like going, doing a big step, and you do it a second time, and it's like doing another big step. 
it sounds a bit unnatural. So at the back of my head, I'm like, this is maybe why he's naming the, this song a giant step. <clears throat> so this is kind of interesting to, to see how, um, like, the perception of John Coltrane and this song, like, uh, he created this song entirely geometrically. And uh, so a few months ago, I, I discovered that. Uh, in 1967, the year of his death, he shares with his friend, this diagram, uh, he gives it to Youssef Latif, the saxophonist, and it's not the same visualization as uh, the one I'm using, but it shows that he had a geometric understanding of the music. And John Coltrane is one of the guys who has like uh, taken music to its highest form. So that's one, uh, one example of, uh, um, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, that shows that maybe there are different ways of looking at music, less conventional. Um, this being said, so this vision, is, this visualization is very personal. Okay? It's, uh, it's just my own. But I asked to myself, maybe it can help other people. So I developed uh, an interactive interface, the first interactive interface, and I wanted to test it. So, the whole idea was like to test it on people who, who don't know music, right? Um, so I took a sample, a representative sample of the global population who doesn't know music, and I took my favorite guinea pig, uh, my niece. She's uh, three years and a half on the, on the picture, and she has never touched a, a key of, uh, of piano. She has never played a, a note of music. And what I do, I put her in front of a keyboard, show her a shape. So here it's a pentagram you see on the screen. And I ask her without any further explanation, could you please play this shape? So I'm gonna show you the first uh, notes that my niece uh, has played. I timed it. So she takes it, she takes it as a game first. All the people who have had the chance to learn music, please keep <laughs> your memories at the back of your head when you watch that. She discovers the, the game and I explain her the rules very briefly and then the game starts. So please uh, look at her behavior. She's like very focused, right? She keeps looking at the screen and the piano and I'm not touching the keyboard much, right? Actually, I'm not touching it. And what's happening is, within six minutes, she discovers this shape that is a pentagram, and she will intuitively learn something through visualization. It means that this representation maybe can help kids. What's happening in six minutes is actually bigger than just like drawing shapes. She discovers what we call the pentatonic major of B flat. So the pentatonic major is this. Right? And this is a fundamental concept that helps understand music from a melodic point of view, and this is also the starting point of music improvisation. She's starting to form like a mental representation of music geometrically and it's gonna stay in her uh, brain for the rest of her life. This kind of uh, leads to question the way we envision music, right? Music notation and the process of learning. Music notation has been created to document music. Until uh, the 17th century, there was a lot of improvisation in music, but there was no electrical or digital way to record music, to permanize music. The only way to pass music from one generation to another was by writing it. So along the centuries, then, music notation has been developed. But improvising and creating gave way to more composition and interpretation. On one side, the composer, who spends time writing music, and the interpreters who play music. 
less improvisation, less experimentation, less maybe understanding from the people who play music. So it led to the kind of dogmatization of written music, which is what? Learn how to read music, read music, copy, repeat. Experts in uh, the process of learning, they break down the education into th three elements. Codification, mental representation, and expression. The challenge of learning something is to form a, a mental representation on, of an abstract con con uh, concept. Sorry, Music is very abstract, right? How do you learn it? We're going to use a codification. To explain you this process, uh, I will give uh, an example. I will uh, use uh, the example of um, reading, speaking, reading, and writing. The codification that we're going to use are uh, letters, system of uh, symbols, right? And the mental representation will be we put letters together, we create words. We put words together, we create expressions. And when, once we have understood how it works, then we can create our own expression. We can express ourselves freely, right? And in music, it should be working the same, right? The problem that uh, we, uh, in music is that the, the, the codification that we use, the music notification with the, the staves, right? The little dots on those lines are not intuitive. So the effort of learning is mostly focused on being able to read those notifications. And once we know how to read, then we just play what's being written, and we are told that this is the expression of music. We completely bypass the understanding of music, the fundamental understanding of music with the structures. Uh, learn how to read, read, copy, repeat. For me, it's... Uh, that's how it works right now. The idea that I shared with you that, you know, to see music, it's what we call synesthesia, seeing, uh, visualizing music. So in my case, it's like using shapes and textures. Seeing music, what does it mean? If we describe synesthesia from an engineer point of view, it's about, so synesthesia, it's about creating bridges between senses. Here, we're talking about seeing music. So it's about translating uh, music parameters in visual parameters. And synesthesia, what is it? It's about creating bridges between those elements. But put, to, put like that, then we, create an, we can create an interface. So this is what we've been working on. We've the, we're working on an interface that uses shapes, as I've uh, showed you, as we've discussed. Colors. So each chord is associated to a color. Light. So in harmony, you can play chords that are happy or sad. Uh, it's associated to light. When you play a sad chord, then it creates like shadow effects. When you play a happy chord, it creates like a bright light and textures. So here we have used textures to modelize consonance and dissonance. This is what we, so dissonance express, expresses um, uh, harmonic instability. So we use a texture on the objects that are rough, non-reflective and a bit chaotic. And for chords that are uh, consonant, that expresses harmonic stability, then we use a surface that is sleek, reflective, and smooth. So this is how it looks. And I will give you some... Uh, it's not a lesson, okay. So it's like that. So we're using real-time 3D, so it's, uh, it's all interactive. And uh, if I go to the top view, I'm going to play shapes. 
I can play, for instance, the diminished chord. The diminished chord is something that I see as red velvet, like the, the seats you're sitting on. You know, it's melancholic. It's a bit sad. I can resolve it like that. Okay. So the shapes. You see, I, uh, you can see the chromatic circle. When I play notes together, I create shapes. The colors, I will give you some examples. So the yellow is to modelize what we call the major chord, which is the simplest harmony. But I can, by adding one note, I can make this uh, harmony a bit lighter. If you, if, you, if you close your eyes, this is lighter. Then you see the yellow becoming a bit lighter. If I add another note, I can make it warmer. Then it becomes orange, warmer. The consonants, that's the same. This is consonant, so the texture is uh, reflective, smooth. But if I play this thing that is more dissonant, then you see that the texture becomes uh, non-reflective. These are just uh, some examples of the process that we, uh, we are we're working on. This is something that I've developed for myself, and it helps me like uh, explore music. Um, so I'm not here to give a lesson, but if that kind of approach can uh, help uh, someone else, just my niece, for instance, or other people, I'll, I'll be super happy. Uh, if it can help take uh, shortcuts or accelerate music learning, I'll be super <laughs> happy to share it. Uh, so th to conclude this, uh, this talk, uh, I would like to say uh, when I was a, a student and a, a kid, um, I was struggling a bit uh, at school. Uh, especially in music. And uh, what I would like to share with you is that if you're facing a situation where you, you don't understand something, instead of th thinking that you're dumb and you will never succeed understanding, maybe you should think of, am I using the right method? And if this method doesn't exist, maybe you should invent it. Now we're gonna, we would like to uh, leave you with a bit of uh, magic and so we're going to present you a, a performance with interactive content that celebrates InspireFest and all the great people who came here and all the inspiration. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>